what we started discussing is the next topic on the analysis of forces. I will go over what we discussed and then take off to what we need today. So, we talked about two types of forces, applied forces as well as reaction forces of constraint because whenever there is a joint between links or any two bodies, the joint imposes constraints on the relative motion and the way we wanted to view this is the following way that left to itself the body would have liked to move in a particular manner, but this constraint pulls it back saying that no you cannot move freely like that and therefore it applies some force of the constraint. The reaction force of constraint is what we talked about. Then we looked at two types of analysis, a static force analysis and a dynamic analysis. Static force analysis obviously is simpler, we actually attempted to solve two, three problems also. This is talking about when the mechanism is nearly at rest, accelerations are very, very small, mx double dot kind of forces are small. So, you are looking at what do I need to do to be able to maintain this position, okay. So, that is an easier problem to solve. Then we looked at also dynamic problems. So, we have also placed it in context with what we have discussed so far in the kinematic analysis part before the mid semester exam. We were given the or rather we assumed that we were given the independent degree of freedom, position, velocity, acceleration. We did not really ask who gives this, how is this obtained and so on and so forth. Because in reality, what would happen is that you would have a motor or an IC engine or something like that as an actuator, hydraulic actuator, pneumatic actuator, you would turn it on, okay. So, you would not really give theta, theta dot, theta double dot, but you actually start from the torque speed characteristics of the motor and then your problem begins. So, what we have done so far is given that theta, theta dot, theta double dot, how to find other interconnected bodies. Now, we are asking the question how this thing comes up given the torque, external loads, how do I find theta itself? theta, theta dot, theta double dot because once I know that independent degree of freedom is found, I know how to find others from whatever we have discussed so far. So, that is an important question that we would be talking about. The crucial component of this analysis is free body diagrams. I gave a few examples and I urged all of you who are not fam you know, fresh with free body diagrams to review your uh, textbooks on engineering mechanics. Then we looked at static equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium, you are all familiar with that. Static equilibrium would right hand side would be 0 uh, when you look at the vector sum of all the forces. We are looking at only planar motion, so x, y and then in the plane and then z axis perpendicular to the plane. That is all that we are concerned with. So, these equations we saw and then we solved some problems uh, or rather we posed those problems looked at the number of equations, number of unknowns and made sure that all are matching. So, you will be able to actually solve these type of problems. We postponed the question of uh, drawing the free body diagram of a fixed body link itself. Uh, maybe today's class or the next class we would take it up. We looked at different types of mechanisms, we looked at modeling friction, what are the issues in uh, modeling friction, we looked at some cams and follower systems, we looked at a problem involving gears. So, all the types of mechanisms, linkages as well as higher pair mechanisms, cam followers and gear pair, we have looked at, we studied how we would do a static force analysis. With that as a basis, I will now venture into dynamic analysis. What I would do is to show how in general dynamic analysis is done, but then I would uh, after a couple of problems I would again make you pose the problems and make you feel comfortable that you can solve. So, that we are ready for a tutorial on uh, static and dynamic force analysis problems. But I would focus really 
on one particular mechanism. I would use that as an IC engine mechanism and I would spend more time maybe even much of today's class, next class, the class after that, you know, couple of classes we would spend. What is so big deal about IC engine mechanism you may think of. So, we will discuss that in a little greater detail. As long as IC engines are around, this topic would be of interest. Maybe very soon IC engines would be replaced with electric motors everywhere in automobiles. So, we may not have to spend so much time in understanding it at that time. But as of now, we would look at various engines that are used in bikes, automobile, auto rickshaws, Mercedes car or a BMW car and so on and so forth. So, we would spend some time on that. We talked about two types of dynamic analysis. One we called the force analysis, one we called the motion analysis. In some textbooks, one is called the forward dynamics, another is called the inverse dynamics. I would personally prefer to call it force analysis, motion analysis because it is intuitively clear what you are given, what you are trying to find. If you are looking at dynamic force analysis problem, you are prescribed what is the desired motion. I know that a particular object is in material handling in a manufacturing shop. The objects are moving on a particular conveyor belt with a known speed. And I want to design a robot so that it will go and capture that and lift it and put it somewhere else. So, I know what is the type of motion I want at the end effector hand gripper point. And I want to find out what are the forces, torques, motor torques that I need to generate at various links. And in order to be able to generate that, what is the control law that I should use, all that I would worry about. That is called the force analysis problem. Motion analysis, I say that this is the motors that I have. I start with the machine, what is the motion that will come from time t equal to 0 onwards. That is a simulation problem. That is also very important problem. We saw that the first problem of force analysis is relatively easier of the two problems, but both problems need to be solved. They are both sides of the coin of the Newton's laws, equations of motion. Okay. Let us take um, two, three examples. Let us see uh, how you would be able to proceed. If you have any difficulties, we will discuss those. Please attempt to pose this problem. Okay. This is taken from your book, textbook on Shig by Shigley, mechanism that you have come across before. So, I chose this as a simple example. So, two sliders, one moving along x axis, one moving along y axis you would see in your textbooks this is called an elliptical trammel because the points trace actually ellipse okay uh, the point g would actually trace an ellipse right so you you would think of these two sliders moving like this now you want to find the force f a that keeps v a constant that means a acceleration is zero okay you would realize as you start this that uh, for static analysis you need it to do position analysis at least. Without that you will not be able to do static force analysis because you, unless you draw the free body diagrams and the angles of various links is known, you would not be able to take f cos theta, f sin theta components, sigma f x, sigma f y, all those you will not be able to do unless you know the positions of the links, orientations. And now, you need more than that because you need the center of mass locations acceleration because sigma f x would be mass times acceleration of the cg of the link. And similarly, along x and along y and then alpha of the link i you will need. So, more data you will need and more analysis you would have done before coming to a dynamics problem. Attempt it, let us see how it goes. Draw the free body diagram of all the links. What was given? Assume friction m2 and m4 are negligible or rather what is meant? Just draw the free body diagrams just as you needed practice in uh, before the mid semester for kinematic position velocity acceleration analysis. Unless you are really thorough with those things, you would not be able to solve static force and dynamic uh, force or motion analysis. 
all the mass data are given, M3 is given, M3 is the link of our interest. V A has to be constant that means acceleration of A point A is 0. What would be the first step that you would do before doing anything else you need to be able to draw the free body diagrams. Anybody has a challenge in drawing the free body diagrams for this problem? Yes or no? Okay. Free body diagram is easy right. So what would happen to the free body diagram here we have This is the mechanism. So, this is x axis and this is y axis, I think. Okay. So, somewhere is Cg. This is 3, 2, and 4. So, if you look at 2, one force is coming from here this pin by which 3 is connected to 2. So, R 3 2 you can have some convention so that you do not get confused which force is acting on which link. So, you have some reaction force exerted by link 3 on link 2 you can call it R 3 2 whatever convention you feel comfortable with. Okay, R32 or you could just name these points A, B and you can say RAX, RAY, it is up to you. Okay. So, there is a normal reaction okay. N or R if you want to call it R12 X. Friction is neglected, so vertical in force between 1 and 2 does not exist. Okay. What else? Now, for this fellow, sigma f x is 0, sigma f y is 0, correct? Because V a is a constant, so there is no acceleration involved in this. Similarly, you can draw for 3. equal and opposite. So, that becomes this way. Here you have forces. Okay. Then you will have there is there an external torque? No, nothing. Oh, sorry, there is a force here. I have forgot that. Why you did not tell me? Why no one told me? There is a force that you need to find. Okay. So, here you have R 3 2 y R 3 2 x between 3 and 4 therefore, you can have the same notation R 3 4 x R 3 4 y okay. sigma f x is m 3 a 3 x double dot sigma f y is m 3 a 3 y double dot or if you want to be more specific a g 3. The center of mass acceleration and then take moments about the center of mass sigma m z is i g 3 alpha 3. There is really no sweat to be able to write these equations, draw these free body diagrams, but there you get stuck because you will need this point's accelerations. That means what? You have to go back. Of course, to be able to take moments, you will need also the moment arms of this. So, you need the position information, velocity information, acceleration information in general of all the links. Without that, you won't be able to solve these problems. What is the information we have? We have 
the position information 6 centimeters O A whatever O A B O A B G. So, this is 6 centimeters, this is 8 centimeters and therefore, this is 10 centimeters total and A G is 5 centimeters. So, G is practically at the center, it is ok, 5 centimeter, 5 centimeter is not necessary, but it is ok, yeah. yeah. Summation of F x is mass of the link acceleration of the center of mass. A 3, I have chosen A G 3 I have said, it could be G 2, G 1, G 5, whatever is the link center of mass. So, position information you can extract uh, theta whatever you if you consider this as theta, you will know this theta, you know this x y coordinates and all that. So, at this position you will need to do velocity analysis, acceleration analysis, that information you need to feed into the right hand sides. The information that is given is V A is 12.6 meters per second, acceleration of A is 0. Position x A, x A is 6 centimeters. So, it is single degree freedom system, one independent coordinates, position, velocity, acceleration have been given. So, what you need to do is to conduct the three analysis that we discussed before the mid semester, position analysis, velocity analysis, acceleration analysis and then draw these free body diagrams like this. You would have got the accelerations from the analysis that you have conducted, you would be able to solve this problem. Is the overall procedure clear? We would have a tutorial where you will actually sit down and solve, but I want you to attempt to solve these problems uh, peacefully in your rooms because all the concepts that you need, the equations that you need is are all very simple. But to actually sit down and do it, it will take time. Unless you practice it, you will not be able to finish it in a in a smooth manner. So, you need to understand that these problems build on what we discussed before the mid semester and then take it further. You have to practice this. Any doubts at this stage about this problem? I repeat what? Huh. So, what do you need? You need to be able to draw these free body diagrams first step, correct? You need to be able to set up these equations of motion, second step no problem, third step you will need the accelerations on the right hand side, where will you get those accelerations of the dependent degrees of freedom? You have to go back two steps, do the position velocity acceleration analysis, right? So, you will find the independent from the independent degrees of freedom data given the dependent degrees of freedom, position velocity acceleration. Then come back, substitute these things and then solve for what is not known. Procedure wise it is fairly well structured, very simple, but it will be time consuming. It, if you make mistakes anywhere, they propagate because they are all sequential steps. Position mein kuch gadbad ho gaya, velocity would be wrong, velocity mein kuch gadbad ho gaya, so, acceleration would be wrong and if acceleration they made a mistake, force analysis equations it will be mistake. So, a mistake that you make would propagate through and through. The only way you can minimize such errors is through practice, okay. I have been mentioning to you that the trouble with mechanics is the concepts are very few, but applications are very diverse and while you are applying you have to be very careful okay and that comes only with practice so please try to practice these problems i have taken next example 
also from Shigley's book. Uh, it is a four bar mechanism, single degree freedom system. This is a worked out example in your book. You can sit down and try to solve it yourself first. Here the complication is in great in the more details being given there. First thing that you notice on the output link, so far we have been showing only a simple line to indicate that it is a link that rotates. But now he has given flesh and meat to that body, he has made it okay, center of mass is somewhere else, not on this line okay. So he has drawn actually a link shape what you see there O4 B C. So is the case for the coupler link A B we have been dealing with only a line because we are only interested in so far the geometry of motion. For that the two ends being revolute joints was sufficient, the entire geometry of motion was prescribed by that. But now when you are looking at dynamics you need to bring in where is the center of mass located. That means the links shape and mass distribution in that shape matters. Where is the CG and where is the what is the I about that CG that matters. So G's location is given acceleration of that link center of mass AG3 has been shown. So you need to be able to just study this problem and you need to be able to solve such problems. Any doubts? So G is here and this fellow's G center of mass is here. I think omega 2 is probably constant, omega 2 is 48 radians per second constant angular velocity. So at least alpha 2 is 0, but these fellows will have accelerations and the directions of the accelerations are also indicated. So some amount of data is needed from the velocity acceleration analysis in an exam problem probably these things could be given to minimize your time, but unless you know how it is solved, you won't know what all the data that you need and what has been given and how you will deploy that into the problem. You need to be able to practice it, but this is a worked out example. So you can practice this, draw the free body diagram for the three moving links. Anybody has any doubt? Kya ji? G3. A B ke under hona hai chahiye, under matlab what, under bahar kuch nahi hota hai, it is a link right. So the body could be this, this could be the body okay. So far we have not bothered about the shape of the body link at all because I only needed to know how it moves. Position velocity acceleration information only we were discussing, but now when I start talking in terms of force that causes that acceleration, then I will need to worry about what is the shape of this link. So this link A is here, B is here, okay, pardon me, A B is a link obviously, but the link can be of any shape, of any shape, it could be this way also. could be like this, how does it, we, we did not bother about it till now, it did not affect our analysis at all. So the link 3 for all you care could be like this, A is here, B is here, G3 is here. I do not know, whatever way it maybe does not really, now you will need it. In fact you have to if it is this is a course on design which our mechanical engineering students would do, you have to design that link. You know how what is the motion you need and you will know what are the forces acting on the link. To withstand those forces what should be the cross section? It could be subjected to bending stresses, torsional shear stresses, axial, tensile and compression stresses. What are the forces that are acting on that? Therefore what is the cross section? What is the material that I should use? All that forms a part of design. 
as opposed to kinematic analysis. We are not going as far as design is concerned, but yes. So, this brings up another interesting question. Do you anticipate a design situation problem with the dynamic analysis? Think of it this way, a dynamic analysis would ask you for mass, mass moment of inertia, okay. Who gives you this data? But to do the design, you need to know the forces, okay. You, you are able to pictureize this situation. Supposing you are designing a machine, okay. If you, you know the kinematic analysis, so a position, velocity, acceleration of uh, independent degree of freedom and dependent degrees of freedom, relationships, all that you know, you can do the analysis. But now when you want to do a dynamic analysis, you have been asked to provide you masses and uh, moment of energy of that. That information is not available with you, okay. So that comes only when you know the forces that this fellow has to withstand. But forces that are coming out of a solution of the dynamic analysis problem. So one way would be to say that first I do a static analysis. If I want to maintain this position without any accelerations considered, what would be the approximate order of forces? So it may be 1000 newtons for this link. So I can design for 1000 to withstand 1000 newtons what should be the link cross section, what is the material I should use and all that stuff. Then you perform a dynamic analysis. Then you will realize, oh no, no, it is not 1000 newtons, it is probably 1250 newtons. So you will come back and do the redesign. The mass would change, mass moment of inertia would change because the cross section has now changed or the material has changed and so on and so forth. That is one set of issues. The other set of issues with the design is that, okay, you did a design and then what, okay. You do not get this desired performance suppose from the machine. What do you do as a designer, okay. Because when you have to do the masses, mass moments of inertia and all that, it means you have already taken decisions on what should be the cross sections, what should be the materials. You have taken lot of design decisions and then arrived at this data. Now if that machine that you designed does not give satisfactory dynamic performance, you have to go back and redo these calculations. This is especially a problem. We had uh, done a consultancy project for General Motors once many years ago. If you look at an automotive crash problem, what is the automotive crash problem? When a vehicle is designed and it, there are certain standard crash tests, it should withstand and it should perform well in those crash tests, correct? Then only you can actually sell it in the market. You will get certifications of safety and you will be able to sell it in the market. But by then, when you are ready to be able to perform a test, crash test of your vehicle, either in the computer or in the real physical laboratory, you have to take so many design decisions. All the masses, thicknesses, materials, cross sections, everything, everything has to be fixed. And these teams, some team may be sitting in Japan, some team may be sitting in Singapore, some team may be sitting in uh, Australia, Europe, US, India, all these multiple teams in various geographical locations have worked and identified their components, cross sections, thicknesses, materials, everything. And then you tell that your vehicle has failed crash test. What do they do? Where will they go back and correct all those things? So, Dynamic analysis is not a one shot analysis like this. It is iterative, it goes back and forth, it is messy there. That is real engineering there. Once you get down to that, it is real engineering 
and lot of iterative analysis. So what and these things if you are doing it in the computer, uh, if you are doing a course on finite elements and if I am still around I will come and teach you that, you will do a millions of degrees of freedom in a computer model and then solve that problem. It will, it could take even days in those days on the computer, okay. And then you come back and say that it did not satisfy the crash test. So what they wanted was very simple models, early stage of design itself you should be able to predict how the vehicle will perform in crash. It may not be accurate, but it should be giving a trend analysis, reasonably accurate. So General Motors had approached me and we did some work for them on the uh, crash simulation using some simplified models. So dynamic analysis problems are very, very interesting uh, real engineering problems, okay. Okay, so here I just bring in the notion of the free body diagram of the fixed link which we have so far avoided. We will only be worried about the um, moving links, okay. Now all these forces that I have shown here, if you consider the whole mechanism as one unit, okay, of some shape, entire mechanism's forces are felt at the joints with which it is attached to the fixed ground, so to say, and those forces are actually called the shaking forces on the foundation and shaking moments. So because these forces are not acting at the same point, so this will really result in some moments also. So the so-called ground fixed link faces all these. When the machine is in operation, when your ground is facing all these forces, then the whole thing shakes, right? You do not want that to happen. For two things, if you think of it is a fixed machine, then your whole floor will vibrate. And no other machines can be used uh, on that floor, no other sensitive equipment can be mounted on that floor and so on. So you do not want so much of forces to be transmitted to the ground. If it is a vehicle, this so called ground is really the chassis of the vehicle. Then you are, you cannot drive from here to even Pune or Dewey Patil Stadium to watch the cricket match, where the whole vehicle will keep shaking you won't be able to drive at all, okay. So you don't want these forces to be transmitted so much to the foundation. So what is your next question in dynamic analysis? Assuming that you are able to now do a dynamic analysis, if you have any doubts we can revisit the last two slides, two example problems that we took. But I would assume that because it just involves free body diagrams and Newton's second laws application of equations of motion, you should be able to do it. We would work out some tutorial sheets on that. But then let us move on to, with your permission, interesting questions about how much force gets transmitted to that foundation. And if I do not want it to be transmitted, what do I do? But the machine has to run. So you have to worry about these questions now, okay. Is this okay broadly? Should we move on or uh, you have any doubts about dynamic force analysis, motion analysis? Confident that you can solve problems? How many of you are confident? How many of you are not confident? What happened? Those who are not confident, not confident also, both, both they, you have not raised your hands. Why? What happened? We will know in the tutorial class anyway, do not worry too much about it. Uh, if you have any doubts, always I am available, we can sit and discuss. It just needs free body diagram and Newton's second law. I mean, you have beaten them both to death in your engineering mechanics, 11th standard physics, whatever, whatever, okay. Any doubt, any specific doubts you have, please feel free to ask now also before I proceed further. Can I, shall I move ahead, okay? Any doubts? 
Okay, no doubts, wonderful. So, I would be interested to spend some time on a particular mechanism, which is the slider crank fellow, which we have again come across quite a bit in the tutorials, in the probably in the quiz and mid semester and whatever, whatever. It is a very ubiquitous mechanism, very simple mechanism that involves both a revolute joint and a prismatic joint, very commonly used in all the IC engine mechanisms. What happens here is the combustion chamber gas pressure due to combustion pushes this piston and when this pushes the piston, the translatory motion of the piston is converted to rotary motion of the shaft. The shaft, the OA is actually a shaft. Kinematically, it is represented as a link like that to it, it, something that remember that rotates that is all. What is the shape of that if maybe if it is available in one of these slides, I will show now otherwise next class I will show you. You would be surprised to see the shape of the link OA, where is the G of that OA ke andar rehna chahiye, aisa nahi hota hai, okay. It is a kinematic representation that it rotates about O, okay, it is a shaft. Now, this is what is used in many, many mechanisms. So, what I have shown here is the uh, single cylinder IC engine that is used in a motor bike. The location of the system is right here, engine is right here and then the motion is transmitted through a chain drive in this motor bikes normally through a chain drive to the rear wheel and the front wheel is steered, okay. Fine. So, we are interested now to see how the dynamic forces are set up when the engine is started. We want to see how much forces like we have done here in the previous slide, okay. I am worried about really these forces that come, this is now the motorbike's chassis. On the motorbike, I have mounted the engine, I have started the motorbike, I am going on the road, right. As the engine operates, how much force would I feel? Of course, I would also feel force because of a rough road. I will come to that much later. We are not worried about it right now. So, let us assume that the road is perfectly smooth, absolutely no forces coming from the road uh, in terms of making the whole system vibrate. Let us not worry about that right now. Hmm? So, because of the engine, what are the forces? So, what we would try to understand is to estimate these forces and try to see how to minimize them. That is our next set of questions that we would like to address in the uh, dynamic analysis. Of course, a little more complicated, auto rickshaw uses also single cylinder engines. So, one IC engine slider crank mechanism is right here, okay. If this is the car body, earlier days we used to have this kind of what is called a ladder shaped bodies. Nowadays it has become a monocoque construction, almost the entire body is of single construction, right, whatever. So on that you would have this engine which would be typically multi-cylinder engine. So I would like to go from the single cylinder and try to establish what are the forces then try to see why would, uh, how would I minimize the forces and uh, how do I reduce the effect of the forces at least if I cannot get rid of the forces and then look at multi-cylinder engines which are used in vehicles quite commonly. So, these are the set of questions that uh, uh, would uh, keep us busy in today's class and tomorrow's I mean Friday's class and so on and so forth. So, any doubts, any difficulties at any stage, please feel free to ask me. Of course, uh, what is the effect of uh, these forces on the chassis, chassis design, chassis optimization? Uh, these are all interesting problems which uh, we have had some opportunity to work on with uh, Ashok Lela and Starter Motors and so on and so forth uh, in their design. If you look at this uh, IC engine, I am looking at the example of a four stroke engine. Anyone not familiar with four stroke engine, never ever 
thought about four strokes and so on and so forth. What happens in these four strokes is that four strokes meaning that 0 to 360 degrees rotation of the crank, piston is moving from top dead center to bottom dead center and then that is one stroke, second stroke, third stroke, fourth stroke. These four operations can be finished in two strokes that is going from top to bottom and then bottom to top again. Then it would become a two stroke engine, okay. One of them if you understand, the other is not difficult. Four stroke engine is easy uh, to my mind because all these strokes are cleanly separated out, okay. So in the first stroke, you are sucking in air, let us say if it is a petrol engine, you are sucking in simply air. If you have to suck in air, your pressure inside that combustion chamber has to be slightly lower than the atmospheric pressure. Then only you will be able to suck it in. So your cam that you designed in the before mid semester should keep the inlet valve open and hold it open the dwell that you resolved in the mid semester question, right? All of you designed the cam profile. So the dwell that provided the inlet valve to be held open would help you to suck in air as the piston moves down. The moment you have gone down enough, you have sucked in enough air, this fellow should close and remain closed. So you have again designed that cam profile to provide a dwell for that, no? it should remain there. Now the piston moves up again, that is a compression stroke. So you are actually working on to compress air. So the pressure gradually builds up around the time it reaches top dead center again. So this was top dead center position of the piston, it has come to near bottom center and then it again reaches the top center, crank has gone through 180 degrees. Just around that point, the spark ignition takes place and the petrol burns, okay. Exactly when you do it, how you do it, etc. must have been taught to you in some course on uh, IC engines uh, for the mechanical engineering students, metallurgy students there is no course like that. Uh, a lot of interesting work happens in controlling exactly when that spark should happen, okay. That ignition is all a problem of motor control. That is where uh, those of you who have done a course with uh, Professor Shashi in our mechanical department, he has his own startup. He did his BTEC like you from IIT Madras, then PhD from my Berkeley, came back and joined us. He has his own startup on motor controllers. So it controls exactly when the spark is ignited. By being able to control that, he is able to ensure better combustion. His device is now part of almost every vehicle that you see around you with the TVS, with Tata Motors, this, that, etc., etc. Most of the companies buy his device and it has helped to save probably hundreds of thousands of liters of petrol by, by virtue of extracting better, more fuller combustion of petrol, okay. Cleaner emission gases and so on and so forth. So this is all a problem of motor control, ignition motor control, exactly when you would, uh, we would not discuss that. But when the pressure, when the combustion happens, tremendous amount of chemical energy is released, gas pressure builds up. Okay. Then the piston is pushed down, that is what you would see here, gas pressure builds up and then gradually it comes down. So here again now the piston has been pushed down to bottom most position. This is actually the power stroke. So when you think of IC engine, only this stroke power is generated, let us say. Then you have to get rid of those exhaust gases, so you are again working to push them out of the system piston moves from below to the top and pushes it out. So again the cam that you designed in your mid semester question paper will now help to keep the exhaust valve open. 
so that all the exhaust gases can go out. And this is one cycle of operations happens in how much time? So, we discussed the other day it is about 3000, 5000, 6000 rpm. If you think of 6000 revolutions per minute, it is about 100 times per second. This is what is happening inside your IC engine in a motorbike or in an auto rickshaw or in a car or whatever you take. But inherently this is a problematic proposition for us when you look at the machine because the power is not uniform, power okay, is not uniformly delivered. Only one stroke out of the four strokes is generating power, delivering you power, rest of the time no. So, power fluctuates within the cycle. Now, multiple problems that you can think of because of this. So, you need to first find out what is the power that is available to you, what is the torque that is available to you at the wheel when you want to drive the machine, right, vehicle. So, that is first thing that we would be worried about. So, I will list a few issues that we would like to uh, analyze in this case. But from the mechanism's point of view, if you look at the gas pressure, the gas pressure pushes the piston. Piston is not simply moving down only, it is connected to the crank shaft that rotates. So, this translatory motion is converted to rotary motion through the connecting rod. So, whatever force that generates the torque that drives the crank shaft it has to be transmitted through the connecting rod. So, if you imagine the free body diagram of the piston, the gas force is acting on it trying to push it down. If the connecting rod has some force F connecting say Fc, only Fc cos phi is able to, is going to be Fg, is going to balance the gas force. So, ideally you would like phi to be how much? How much should phi be ideally? You want it to be low or high? Low, high. High how many? Low how many? Low, low. How many? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, eight. High how many? How many want phi to be high? If phi is high, supposing phi is high, what happens to Fc? That is what I have written down here. Fc sin phi goes into actually the side thrust. Again, go back to this, this side thrust. What is what you are seeing as the cylinder side thrust? This is the so called fixed ground link, which is the chassis of the vehicle on the motorbike where you have mounted it. So, the side thrust goes instead of actually helping you to rotate that crankshaft which is connected to the wheels, it is simply going into the vehicle body shaking it up. So, you would want phi to be as low as possible first. However, however low it may be, okay, however low it may be, it still is not negligibly small. So, the inherent problem of a slider crank mechanism of converting reciprocatory motion into rotary motion through a linkage like this is that you have connecting rod force acting at an angle taking care of the gas forces. So, therefore, you have inherently some side thrust whatever you do some forces will have to be generated onto the machine. Okay. So, you, those of you who have done a course on IC engines, you know that you can get rid of the piston altogether by using what is it? You do not need to have the piston and the slider crank mechanism business at all because what we are trying to do is to use that chemical energy in the fuel to drive my that uh, crankshaft and through that to the vehicle wheels. So, how do you get rid of this piston and uh, cylinder and slider crank and whatever? 
have scam and follower no you must have studied about uh, about the uh, wankel engine it looks like this roughly it looks like this so all of these the, it has a shape like this it will keep rotating the piston is piston is actually rotating and this profiles create a little little combustion chambers let us say for you to understand ok. So, you do not need to have this reciprocating motion converted into rotary motion directly the piston would be like this Wankel engine is that example. So, you can read up about it if you have done a course on IC engines the professor would have made a mention about this and so on ok. But as long as uh, we are living with IC engines. So, the way to get phi to be very small is to make L as large as possible compared to R correct. So, that is why in your mid sum question you would have been told R is far far less than L ignore higher order terms ignore higher order terms was the implication ok. When R is far far less than L R by L itself is 1 by 4, 1 by 5 like that 1 by 10. So, R by L whole square will be 1 by 25, 25 or 1 by 100 and so on. So, you can ignore higher order terms ok. That was implied when the question said R far far less than L. I hope you guys caught that hint ok. So, you will keep R as less as possible compared to L fair enough, but you have to have some size limitations you know I mean you have seen the uh, way it is mounted in your motorbike you have so much space only. So, you cannot have extremely large L with respect to R. So, practically you would have some limitation. So, that determines your values range of phi and so on ok. So, the questions that we would like to analyze understand and once you articulate the questions I always keep telling all my students that you have to as a scientist you in any problem you may be dealing with you first should articulate correctly what are the questions that you are trying to find answers for. Once you articulate the questions correctly even if you do not have all the tools to find all the answers there will be someone in the group who will have those tools and then you will be able to find eventually the answers. But if you do not articulate the questions correctly you will never find the answers you will never solve the problem that you are really facing. So, here the kind of questions that we want to understand are first question is of pure academic interest not really of uh, dynamics of machines class interest. We want to figure out he ok I mean I am using petrol fuel and so on I burn it how much actually torque do I generate at the crankshaft ok. So, it is purely of academic interest, uh, but if you are doing an IC engine thing you would really be worried about it and trying to figure out ok. Similarly, you would try to find what are the inertia forces and torques at the crankshaft, what are the shaking forces and moments on the frame which is your engine body and it is mounted on the <coughs> vehicle itself vehicle is moving on the road. So, you are in a motor bike or an auto rickshaw and all that stuff in the car you are sitting on that shaking engine. So, you need to figure that out and we would try to worry about how do you balance out these shaking forces and moments single cylinder, multi cylinder, inline, V different types of configurations. Um, as I said I used to teach this half semester course as a full semester course long back uh, for many years it used to be a full semester course. So, what we are going to do now is to just uh, touch upon these topics. So, if I get carried away a little you can uh, pull me back where is class representative. So, you can you are authorized to pull me back it is likely that I get carried away because I used to teach it as a full semester course I have probably enough material to last uh, more than a course, but we have time limitation we have about 8 10 classes more. So, we would need to touch upon these topics I would make you make sure that you understand 
what are the physical principles concepts and how they are govern the applications. Applications are live problems of interest to us. We want to know why I should spend 50 lakhs buying a BMW or a Mercedes Benz car and not probably couple of lakhs buying a different model car. What difference does it make? Okay. Why some vehicles would be more comfortable compared to other vehicles? Okay. So, that is the broad question that I am going to drive at. One component of that is these shaking forces, how you achieve balance and all that stuff. We have seen now part of the problem when you use a single cylinder, you are inherently asking for troubles because only one out of four strokes is a power stroke. So, the torque keeps on fluctuating. So, that is a fundamental problem and you we will now look at what are the moving links and masses and shaking forces and all that stuff. We would say that is a second fundamental problem with the IC engine and it is our job as mechanical engineers and material science engineers to figure this out to solve this so that people can make hundreds of thousands of cars and sell them. Okay. So, we would like to worry about these things. Uh, one interesting issue I hope I will get time to talk about is that one out of four strokes being a power stroke. If you look at the torque speed characteristics of the IC engine, you do not deliver a uniform constant torque to the crankshaft. Only one out of the four strokes is a power stroke, right? So, you do not deliver that. Whatever you deliver, there is no guarantee that the output load demands exactly the same torque every instant of time. So, imagine that the torque in a cycle is say the demand is constant. I would call that the loading torque the load demands constant torque, but you are giving delivering a torque like this suppose. In a cycle you are delivering like this. So, this is your driving torque, driving torque is like that. I am just exaggerating it. So, to illustrate the point what would happen instant to instant if you apply your Newton second Newton Euler equations of motion, simply what would happen you can imagine what would happen to the speed of the shaft when the driving torque at this instant of time, at this instant of time when the load demanded is more than the available driving torque what would happen to the speed? It decreases, right? It decreases, right? That is what you would find, you know, when all the, uh, you know, uh, hopefully it happens in the morning and all the hundreds of bathrooms you have, everybody switches on the geyser, okay? Everybody's that load, peak load would be very, very high demand. So, every, immediately what would happen? The tube lights in your room become a little dimmer, a little dimmer. Correct. So, the same way this fellow the moment the load torque is more than the demand sorry, I mean driven, driving torque the speed will go down and when the driving torque is more for this portion of time in the cycle the driving torque you are pumping in more energy into the system and the load does not demand so much at this instant of time. What will happen to the speed? It keeps racing up. So, what you call as 1000 rpm machine, 5000 rpm engine and all that stuff, the speed rpm is a gross number. I mean now you have all crossed those limits. You are no longer a layman saying 5000 rpm 
and all that stuff. As a lay person, it is okay. But now you are all, you know, advanced engineers from IIT. So you should know that it is a gross number over average speed over a cycle and all that stuff. So instantaneously, if you are looking at minutely, so the speed keeps on fluctuating. So it is not just related to IC engines, it is related to any application. You are cutting, say for example, you are looking at a uh, lathe or a milling machine or a grinding machine or any machine tool, okay. Just imagine that uh, something is being fed, a metal sheet blanket is being fed and from on the blank you need to cut. You have to coordinate the X and Y motions, you have to cut it when it is fed by some amount. Okay. If the speeds keep on fluctuating in a cycle, would you get a perfect cut? You would not get. Okay. So for any application, fluctuations in speed have to be reduced. You cannot afford to have fluctuations. Instantaneous in a cycle, you cannot have fluctuations in the speed. You would like it to be as uniform as possible. Ideally, absolutely constant. When you design a precision servo machine mechanism to put, to do an assembly job, for example, you are designing an assembly robot, okay. You are, you have to put a pin in a particular slot, okay. Now, when you are going there and your speed keeps on fluctuating, so your hand gripper which is holding the pin and also the other component some other robot is holding and that keeps shaking. This could be for example, for I mean, hopefully we would not face this situation, but eventually we, all of us would. It is a robot which is performing surgery on us, okay. Just imagine it could be an eye surgery, okay. It is an eye surgery, it is common now, I mean in many hospitals in Mumbai, you have robots performing surgery, right. The knee replacement is a constant example, even recently in the newspapers some hospital has advertised that we have acquired two robots for uh, you know knee replacement surgery and so on and so forth. So the robot hand imagine it is coming close to your knee and when I had my surgery on, on my femur, the doctor actually asked me would you like to pass out or would you like to watch what is happening. Okay. Depending on that we will determine your dose of anesthesia. So the doctor might ask you, you are a mechanical engineer, would you like to watch how the robot is performing surgery on you? Imagine the robot holding the scalpels and knives and comes close to you and its hand is shaking like this, okay. It's your job as mechanical engineers, as students of dynamics of machines to design that there are no vibrations. All the dynamic forces are balanced. All the speed fluctuations are controlled. So what we are facing now, the question that we want to address is that we all know that is our eventual fate. My knees would give out just as your knees would give out, okay, before we pop out. It's only a matter of Q. Q mein, uh, aap, sab log khatar mein hai. Somebody is ahead of us, somebody is, is after us, that's all. Okay. So we will all go under the knife of the robot and by the time you guys come to my age and all that, I'm hundred percent sure it will be only robots which will <coughs> do surgery. If you actually talk to, I had good friends who are brain surgeons. So that fellow does an, surgery means say, he will go in the morning and he will come out in the evening. It's, it could take even 8 hours, 10 hours and so on. He does not drive at all. I was surprised to see because I keep driving out uh, a lot. So when I talked to him, he said he does not drive at all. Because he says for him, the precision of holding the knife to sub millimeter accuracy is extremely important when he is doing surgery on the brain of a patient and if he keeps on driving because of the vibrations that come to the steering wheel and eventually to the hand, he actually cannot hold steadily.
so he never drives. You can talk to any number of surgeons, many of the good surgeons around in the city, they would not drive, they would not prefer to drive, because they value their steadiness of hands very, very much. And now you are replacing the with the machines and robots and all that, you have to make sure that the motors and the linkages that transmit these motions are extremely precise. Okay. So, you would see here based on the torques of the load torque versus the supply driving torque fluctuations in a cycle, the cycles may be 100 times a second, it still is this problem does not get resolved. It is only for a short time, a lay person may think like that, but for you it is not a short time, it is an extremely critical time. You have to make sure that the torque and load torque and the supply driving torque are matched and any fluctuations are there between these two, they have to be ironed out, that is our job. If after all this still, we, I will describe some more measures, if after all of these things still they fail, there are vibrations, there are unbalanced things and so on and so forth, we have to think of a good active vibration, isolation, suppression, control system. Okay. So, you now see how the various courses that you are being taught actually come together in realizing a world class machine. It could be for agriculture, it could be for healthcare, it could be for machine tools, any space applications, whatever, whatever. All these individual courses that you have been doing, whether it is material selection, whether it is engineering mechanics, whether it is CADOM, controls, motors, you know, whatever, whatever courses, all of them finally fall in place. So, what we would do considering the composition of the class with the third year mechanical and second year metallurgy, no disrespect meant to anyone, but considering the variations in the composition of the class, what we would essentially be touching upon is an what I would call as an approximate analysis, so that you understand what are the issues involved. In all likelihood, none of you will ever do any of what we are discussing after this semester. Hardly anyone may remain in core sector and so on and so forth. So, you will forget the details, but I want to highlight the issues which you will remember when you buy your first car. Many of us buy the car when we like the how it looks, not what is inside the bonnet, okay. but here we are trying to go inside the bonnet and trying to figure out through an approximate analysis. So, I would do lot of simplifications, good amount of hand waving, do not get into details. Uh, Goshen Malik is an ac accessible textbook that is available in the library that does a detailed analysis of this problem. I will pick up some slides from that also. Uh, but just to, to highlight kind of, but the analysis we would do in the class will be very simple, very uh, basic analysis that throws up what are the basic issues. So, keep this in mind, I would also assume that engine runs at constant speed, it never runs at constant, you have seen that, okay. the driving torque only one stroke out of four strokes is a power stroke, so it will never run at a constant speed but I will just forget all that and say that it is running at a constant speed. I would assume that minor fluctuations in the speed within a cycle are negligible, theta double dot is 0. Okay. So, we would look at the problem of gas forces and inertia forces separate, separate. Uh, gas forces as I said, we would not really be doing anything more with the analysis later. But inertia forces, yes, it will be of interest to us. We will try to answer more questions based on that. And we would assume that friction is negligible, which is again a major assumption. 
lots of lubrication is provided and all that stuff we assume uh, friction is negligible ok. So, before we conclude I will show this slide which is again indirectly referring to your mid semester question of I think second question or third question I do not remember now ok. So, when you did a position analysis of a slider crank mechanism whichever way you did it the piston position is given by this that is exact that is why I put is equal to sin phi is r by l sin theta is also exact. So, therefore, here cos phi becomes this that is also exact a formula has been given at the beginning of the paper about binomial theorem some of the useful formulae were listed at the beginning of the question paper binomial theorem has been given ok. So, if I adopt that it becomes approximate because I have not taken higher order terms. How good or bad is that approximation is shown here if r by l is small as it goes down this is the original formula square root of 1 minus r by l square and I am taking only the first term 1 minus half of r by l square that is the binomial expansion may first term. The difference between these two you can see is extremely small as r by l becomes 1 by 4, 1 by 5 and lower. So, that is what was expected in the mid semester paper binomial theorem was given in the beginning r is far far less than l is mentioned in the question. So, you were expected to make these connections and then apply it in the problem ok all the best.